Hello, chefs. This is Chef's PSA Podcast. I'm your host, Andre Natera. On today's episode, we're going to get into the final part, part three of food costs. So stay tuned. Before we get into it, let me give you a quick update for those of you that have been asking. The Chef's PSA book series that I've written is now translated into Spanish. So for those of you that need those books for yourself or maybe for your kitchen staff, it's available. Go support Chef's PSA. Go get those books. They should be like in every chef's office or in on every line cook's clipboard. That's really where they belong. Now, I've done some free ebooks as well. So I did a two-part series here on Chef's PSA, how to open up a restaurant. I turned that into a guide. It's available also on chefspsa.com. I have 100 basic recipes that I've written. That's also available. And a culinary dictionary for new people that don't understand some of the words or slang that we use in professional kitchens. That's also available. If you want me to turn this three-part series of understanding food cost into a guide, let me know. shouldn't take me that long. I'm in the process of wrapping up the Spanish translation. I'm moving into Italian translation, and then I could work on the food cost guide, or maybe I'll take a quick break and get that done in a couple of days. So anyway, if that's something that you guys want, let me know. Now, this is part three of the series when it comes to food cost. If you'll recall, episode one was really understanding what money is and how to see money as food and how they're interrelated. So I said, you have no business managing the money in your restaurant if you don't even know what money is. So go back and listen to that episode if you haven't. The second part was really understanding the different formulas when it comes to managing food costs. As I said, if there's one thing that you take away from this entire series, cost divided by sales equals food cost percent. And that's the formula that you're going to use pretty much for your entire career as a chef. And it doesn't just apply to food costs. It applies to labor costs and so many other things, but that's the formula. Cost divided by sales equals food cost percent. On today's episode, we're going to talk about, so you've identified a food cost problem. How do you fix it? And then what are some of my strategies when it comes to addressing food cost issues. So here's something. Whenever I've taken over a new job as an executive chef, the first thing that I've done, well, I have a whole strategy and I could probably do a whole podcast on that. But normally what I do is I go into a place and I write down 100 areas where I could lower food cost percent. So that way it's fresh in my mind and I write down 100 things that I could do. What are the opportunities? What's the low hanging fruit that I could address food cost? And I don't do anything. I just write the ideas down and I save them for later. And the reason I do that is because whenever you start a job, usually they want you to impact several things. They want you to impact quality and they want you to impact the finances, right? That's usually the job of an executive chef. You're managing the finances, you're managing the people, you're managing the quality. You're measured on all these things, right? Your financials, quality, people. The three-legged stool, as it's called in business. And so anyway, I go in and I write down these 100 things, these 100 opportunities to reduce cost. And when upper management comes to me and says, hey, we need to lower food costs a little bit, I could go back and look at that list that I had written early when I had just begun the job. And I pull out a couple of things that I want to change, and then I could make an immediate impact on food cost. And then boom, everyone's happy again. And then a couple of months go by and they're going to say, hey, we need to lower food cost again. I then go back to that list and I whittle away at those items, but I never give them everything up front. And I would caution you, if you do follow this, don't give them everything up front because then you have nothing else when they say, that was great, give me more. And inevitably, as a chef, they always do. You give them, you give them a point, they want two points in food costs. So that's a strategy that I have when it comes to lowering food costs is identify as many opportunities that you can to lower food costs, but don't implement all of them. Only implement them as you need to. The other thing, and again, this is my personal strategy when I would go into places previously, is I was never the person to hit food cost on the nose or lower. If anything, I would hit it on the nose or a little bit higher. And I'm not talking much higher. I'm talking like a half a percent or a percent, just enough to avoid no one notices in this you know, sneaky tactics that I'm giving you. And the reason was, is because I never wanted to set myself up for failure the following year. So for those of you that have never been an executive chef, Usually the way it works is ownership's going to come to you or upper management's going to say, okay, you gave us, you know, 25%. Can you give us 24%? You gave us 24%. Can you give us 23%? And then it's just a race to the bottom after that. It becomes a slippery slope and you're always chasing 
a way to find food costs to get it lower. And that's not necessarily the most productive for a lot of chefs. So I would always strategically go the other way. I would raise food costs a half a point, and then I'd raise it another half a point. So after the course of time, what they didn't notice is that I was gradually increasing the food cost. Now, by gradually increasing food costs, and I'm not talking 10%, I'm talking about percentage 0.1, half a percent, maybe 1%. And the reason I was doing that is that would allow me to buy better quality ingredients because this allows me to go back and say what I had said earlier in this series is I never wanted to be known as the chef for great food cost because no chef's legacy is really built off having the best food cost in the world. Like who has the best food cost in the world? You don't talk about that chef. You talk about the greats, the Thomas Kellers, the Rene Redzepi, the Ferran Adrias, and so on and so forth. No one ever talks about the chefs who have great food costs. Maybe the owners talk about it and you get a little bonus or something like that, but there's no glory in having great food costs. There's glory in creating good food. So that's just my little caveat. And that was my strategy when I was creating food costs. Now, I will say this again, word of caution, don't go get yourself fired by raising food costs. If they threaten that you're going to lose your job because you've raised it a point, well, then do the right thing. Like I'm not, don't call me up and say, I give you bad advice because I'm not going to, I'm not going to pay your bills for you. So use some discretion. I'm just letting you know what I've done in the past. And the reason I was able to do that is because I always backed it up with the other two. So I always had really good food and my employees were always really happy. So if you have the other two, you can get away with a little bit more when it, on the food cost side. Now, when it comes to tracking food costs, we talked about the formulas and making sure you have good accounting principles. But one thing that I do is there's multiple ways to track food costs. Some places track it for the entire month. Other places track it for the week. And I would track it day to day. The reason I would recommend that you track it day to day is because it's easier to find a blip in the radar to find where that problem is. So if you're tracking it for the entire month and food cost is up 5%, you don't know exactly what day it went sideways. But if you're tracking it every single day, you could say, okay, food cost was 25%, 25%. This day was 40%. Why? And then you could go back and you could look at that specific day and see what the issue was. And typically the issue is usually a sales problem. Maybe revenues weren't what they were supposed to be and you overpurchased that day. Maybe you got hit with a bunch of late invoices from previous months. That also happens. Maybe your vendors snuck something in when you weren't looking, right? But you don't know where to look if you're not tracking day to day. So tracking day to day allows you to have a better grasp on where your food cost is, especially where it's trending for the end of the month and where to correct the problem. Then we could talk about looking at your inventory. So when you're looking at your inventory, you should be able to run simple descending reports on Excel or depending on what program you're using, where you could see where the majority of the dollars are being stored in inventory. And are these items still on the menu? Are they not moving? Do you need to donate them to maybe get them off your balance sheet? These are things that you got to look at. So having a good track of your inventory and looking at where your big dollar spend is going to definitely benefit you in the long run. You don't want to be carrying dead stock. You want to make sure that you're putting it to use and you're rotating your stock and you're getting it out or you're turning it into specials or staff meal or something like that. Now, let's say you have a food cost problem and you need to cut costs. So the first thing that I would look at is I would look at, you know, your top 100 spend items in a kitchen. So you're going to have your top items and your bottom items and your 100 spend. What I would look at is look at the top 10 items and fix those. Don't look at the bottom 10 items because you're really going to have no impact on there. Let me give you an example of what I mean. I was doing a consulting for with a chef in another restaurant and they had food cost issues. And I said, where do you want to look? And we looked at the report and they said, maybe we need to change brands of salt. Now, I don't know if they were like a Morton's or Diamond Crystal. I'll let you guys argue. I don't know what's best. I'm a Diamond Crystal person for what it's worth. Anyway, we digress. This person said, let's look at our salt costs and let's change the brand of salt that we're using. And I remember thinking, well, that's not necessarily going to put a dent in food costs. I said, how much do you spend on salt a year? And I remember it wasn't a large number. It was like $500 a year in salt. And I said, okay. And by switching to this other brand, how much are you going to save? And he like, did the math real quick. He was going to save like 40 bucks. So I said, you're going to save 40 bucks on salt. But all you have to do is shave an ounce off of this protein over here 
and you're going to save $40 off of two pounds of meat. Like it's a no brainer. Think about how much meat you're buying, right? That's where you want to look at is fish where the fish are. Your top spend items, your top 10, your top five, your top two, that's where you're going to make the biggest impact on food cost. Now, if we're looking at specific strategies on the plate, I would say there's things called the protein flip. And what that is now that a lot of restaurants are moving to a more vegetable forward dining experience or veg centric entrees. And I'm not talking vegan or vegetarian. I'm just talking about like, it's a plate of vegetables garnished with meat. So for example, you have a plate of grilled broccoli garnished with pork belly, as opposed to a pork belly dish with a little bit of broccoli. So you flipped it a little bit and vegetables in this case typically are going to be less expensive. So it's a good way to reframe your menu and put items on there that are more profitable. Another way to look at it is shrink the portion size. A simple ounce here and an ounce there on your expensive proteins could be big savings. If you're looking at meat, for example, and let's say you're paying $30 a pound for meat and you've shaved it one ounce, for every 16 portions you sell, you're saving $30, right? If you shaved it two ounces, you're saving $60 for every 16 portions of protein that you sell. So that's gonna make a bigger impact than looking at the brand of salt that you're using. Then other places that you wanna look is you wanna look at your menu abstracts and maybe people call it menu engineering, stuff like that, where you can look at which items are moving, which items are not moving, which items are profitable, which items are not. And you wanna look at those items. And the idea is to have as many profitable items and get rid of the items that are not. I talked about this the other day, I put up a video on it on Chef's PSA. Instagram account where I talked about the 80-20 rule or the 70-30 rule when designing menus. 70% or 80% of your menu should be items that people are familiar with that are going to move, that are going to sell. The other items could be, you know, the 20 to 30% could be the experimental items. And the reason I recommend that is because you don't want to go the opposite way and go 70% experimental and 30% of the items are the fastball down the middle because you're probably realistically going to sell the 30%. And that 70% is going to use up space in your cooler. It's going to be inventory that's going off and that's most likely items that are not going to move. So put your focus on the 70% and the 80%. So when you're looking at that 70 and 80%, make sure that they are profitable. Make sure that your recipes are costed accurately. Now I'm not saying you got to go cost your recipes every week, but if you have a software system, and a lot of places do, where the recipes speak to the inventory system, that's a good way to make sure that your costs are in line. Sometimes it's a simple matter of human error. You costed your recipe incorrectly, or you put one too many zeros or not enough zeros. And so you thought a particular item was more profitable than what it was. So again, looking at your recipes and making sure those are accurate, making sure you're doing proper menu engineering to make sure you have the right mix of menu items on your menu. And then you also wanna make sure you're looking at your point of sale system. So in a lot of cases, this is your micros, I've, I've been a chef of places where we've had items on the menu for months and no one caught that there was a discrepancy on the menu and in the point of sale system. So every time we'd sell a certain dish, we were losing $2 according to the menu price. Now that's common, that mistake happens. So it's very important that you're auditing your menus and your point of sale systems every time you make a menu change. So you could see if there are any discrepancies um, on the price from the menu, point of sale system to make sure that you are not losing any money. Other things that you could do is maybe your menu is too big. Maybe you need to shrink it a little bit. Maybe you need to look at the amount of garnish that you have. So I know all these flowers and microgreens are pretty, but a lot of times they're also extremely expensive. So then you have to ask yourself, does that particular garnish bring value to the dish? Maybe you got to look at it and say, you know what? Maybe we don't use that flower, or maybe we have a certain amount of flowers. I remember I was looking at something that's like every flower we put on the plate was like 75 cents. And I was like, shit, these flowers are expensive. Anyway, it's neither here nor there. So basically make sure that everything that's on the plate has a purpose, is functional, and is bringing value to the plate. You don't want to be putting things on the plate that are increasing it significantly in cost, but bringing zero value. And that's something that you got to do. Now, the last thing I will say when it comes to food cost the most important thing that you could do is just take action. Start to understand it. Start looking at your costing everywhere. Start looking at food as dollars. Train your team to view food as dollars. Train them to not see 
what's in the garbage bin as garbage or waste or trim, but view it as dollars. What could it have turned into? Start viewing your menu as the way that your restaurant makes profit. That's what brings dollars in. And as I said before, the lifeblood of a restaurant is money. Cash has to be flowing through the restaurant to keep the doors open, to keep the employees paid, to keep your bills paid with your vendors, and to make sure that your restaurant is open. So you must be a good steward of the business and make sure you're making good business decisions with your food cost. Anyway, I could talk about food cost all day long and still not cover everything that needs to be discussed. But I hope you enjoyed this three-part series on food cost. And like I said, if you want me to make a guide on this, let me know. I could probably turn around a guide pretty quick for those of you that need something more tangible to remind you about how to look at food costs and just some best practices that I have. Also, I cover food cost extensively in Culinary Leadership Fundamentals book. There's also a video course that I have where I also cover food cost in depth as well. You can find all of that on chefspsa.com. If you want to support the show, Make sure you leave five stars, hit the subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening or watching. You might be watching on YouTube. Hit the like button, subscribe. Go to chefspsa.com, get yourself some merch, go get yourself some books, get the free books. We'll see you next week. Hit the porno music.